Keith Williams. Welcome to Five Watt World. We're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. After a decade as a custom guitar builder, having built guitars for Carlos Santana, Ted Nugent, and Peter Frampton, by the end of 1985, a young Paul Reed Smith moved into a factory on Virginia Avenue in Annapolis, Maryland. He did this solely on the backs of orders he generated from a recent sales trip and on their success at the Winter NAMM show. That spring, they worked on the 20 or so guitars that they were prepping for the upcoming Summer NAMM show, and the first serial number instruments came off the line in August of 85. By that time, he had 18 people working at the factory. Now, in December of 2019, PRS employs over 300 people and produces approximately 1,800 guitars a month. How did PRS, in just 35 short years, become one of the big three guitar builders in the world? And how did the history of their flagship model, the Custom 24, figure into that success? If you're as curious as I am, stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of the PRS Custom 24. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. And if you've already subscribed, swing by the store and grab a t-shirt or a mug to support what we're doing here. There's a link in the description. Any student of guitar history will recognize the construction principles of the iconic 50s Les Paul. Like so many inspired innovations, the earliest PRS guitar was not revolutionary, but it was rather evolutionary. In 1982, Smith told Guitar Player magazine, the whole idea is to understand why those old Les Paul guitars, the standards, the customs, TV models, cherry sunbursts, and gold tops were great guitars. He said, to my ears, old Junior specials Les Paul sounded good. So did old Strats with Brazilian rosewood boards. Sometimes the maple board ones sounded really good too. The PRS guitar appeared in a market crowded with oddly shaped hair metal guitars, and it was a breath of fresh air. The custom, as it was simply called, had a one-piece mahogany neck glued into a one-piece mahogany body topped with a uniquely carved maple top with what became known as a natural binding. Smith hadn't used the traditional plastic binding, instead opting for the natural curly maple showing through. Smith didn't shy away from the combination of Fender meets Gibson influences. He settled on a 25-inch scale, somewhere between the 25 and a half inches of most Fenders and the 24 and 3 quarters of many Gibsons. He intentionally split the difference between the two worlds, hoping to reach both the Strat guys and the Les Paul guys so as not to lose half of his market right out of the chute. Smith said, we took a Strat shape and a Junior shape and drew them on top of each other and averaged the lines. And that came out looking horrible. It was unusable. So I started on the new design, my baby. I worked very slowly and it took about two years to draw. There were two guitars, an all mahogany guitar and the one with a fancy maple top. On the early price list, they listed the all mahogany guitar as the Paul Reed Smith guitar and the curly maple top guitar as the Paul Reed Smith custom. It wasn't until 87 that the mahogany guitar became known as the standard. Of the early model designations, Paul simply states, the PRS model with the moon inlays was supposed to be a working man's guitar. It just so happened that most people wanted the curly maple top. There was a wafer style five-way rotary switch, which gave you the full humbucking positions, but also split coil sounds that you might've found on a Stratocaster. And interestingly, there was no tone control on the guitar. Rather, there was a sweet switch this switch simulated the use of a 104 foot guitar cable. As anyone that's looked into adding buffers to their pedal board would have learned, adding cable between your guitar and amp adds capacitance, effectively rolling off the top end. By most accounts, this was added at the request of Carlos Santana. It was moving from using very long guitar cables on stage to a wireless system, and this was there to simulate the cable tone he was used to. The guitars had speed knobs that were connected to what we now call PRS standard treble and bass pickups. The neck shape of the pre-factory and early factory guitars were very similar to the current pattern neck. And if you're curious about the history of neck carves at PRS over the years, I'll refer you to an excellent page on the PRS website. The minutia of changes in shapes and models is detailed there and is worthy of a video of its own. The fretboards on the early guitars were made of Brazilian rosewood and they covered a single action truss rod. The original Santana commission had sent Smith tracking down everything he could learn about keeping a Strat vibrato in tune. The Generation 1 vibrato was the work of Smith and John Mann, an engineer and guitarist that Smith had met in 78. When Mann needed an SG that he'd received as a wedding present from his cousin, refinished, his cousin referred him to Paul, and the rest as they say is history. The bridge they built together had a single casting of both the bridge plate and the block. It's a six screw pivot bridge, like a vintage Strat, but with each screw notch, so there's a specific pivot point for the knife edge of the bridge plate. 
Mann had suggested the walled surround on the plate to eliminate sideways movement of the saddles, and the original screws used were stainless steel to eliminate corrosion. The Barada arm itself is also the product of Smith's experience repairing Stratocasters. Screw-in Strat arms often broke off if over-tightened, requiring an expensive repair. To avoid this, they designed a push-in arm. The early ones were simply lubricated to fit, but the later ones had Delrin bushings, an adjustment screw for tension. But the success of the system doesn't come down to just the vibrato itself. It also depends on the nut, which was made from a nylon Teflon compound, and the PRS locking tuners that were fitted as standard. Smith developed the tuners with Eric Pritchard, and together they developed the original wind collar tuners that were on the original guitars at NAM in 1985. The first review of the guitars was done in the April 86 issue of Guitar Player magazine. The reviewer was no less than luthier Rick Turner, who is probably best known for building guitars used by Lindsey Buckingham and Fleetwood Mac. Turner concluded the review saying, I've not played an electric guitar I like better, and very few I liked as much, including ones I made myself. This is a wonderful, subtle instrument for discerning players who know the difference. But all this quality came at a price, a really big price. A fully loaded custom with bird inlays and Brazilian rosewood fingerboard listed for $1,550. In the same year, a Gibson Les Paul Standard listed for $995, and a US-made vintage style Strat listed for $750. So there may have been grumblings about the high price, but when you looked at the construction, unique parts and finishing, and amount of handwork, it brought that price back into focus. Remember, the Fender Custom Shop was founded in 87 and the Gibson Custom Shop would not be formalized until 93. Paul Reed Smith was setting out to create custom shop quality in woods, hardware, and construction in the production guitars at PRS before the big two had even created their custom shops. It might be argued that the advent of PRS and their early success was a wake-up call to both Gibson and Fender. And on top of that, PRS had succeeded in doing something that neither of the others had done in over 30 years. They brought an entirely new guitar style to the market, and it sold. By the mid-80s, Fender and Gibson's best efforts were concentrated on looking back to their beginnings and trying to recreate their glory days, whereas PRS learned from them both and leapfrogged over them into the future. Early adopters of the new guitar included Tom Johnston from the Doobie Brothers and David Grissom, who was playing with Joe Ely at the time. After the huge push that brought the custom to market was done, they headed down the road of constant improvement that continues to this day. The first batch of changes had to do with the electronics. In October of 87, the rotary switch's middle position, which was originally both pickups in a humbucking mode, like the middle position of a Les Paul, changed to what they called Series Strat, a sweetened version of position two, bridge and middle pickups of Stratocaster. This was accomplished by using the two inside coils of the humbuckers and wiring them in series. The next change was to remove the out-of-phase sound and it was replaced with two, the two outside coils of the humbuckers for a sound they described as deep and clear, like a Telecaster with both pickups on. By 1991, the pickups would be replaced with what PRS called the HFS and vintage bass pickups, and the fretboards were changed from Brazilian to Indian Rosewood, except for limited runs. Though the Custom 24 was evolving, and guitars could be ordered with lots of custom options, there wasn't another model in the catalog until the Custom 22 in 1993. The 22 was the result of the ultra high-end project Dragon Guitars that PRS had made with a shorter and stiffer 22 fret neck. Smith really liked the different sound of the 22 fret neck, so by the next year all the guitars in the line were offered with a 22 fret neck as well. But not just the length of the neck had changed. The standard neck shape moved to what PRS called their wide fat, known in the UK as the artist profile, which was the width of the wide thin neck with the depth of the standard neck profile. The heel of the neck was lengthened as well to add stiffness. A stop tailpiece version of the guitar became available in 93 too. It was at this time that the Custom had to become known as the Custom 24 to differentiate it from the new Custom 22 guitar. In 93, they moved to the second generation two-piece tremolo bridge. The first gen trem, as you might remember, was a single cast block, but the second gen bridge was a more traditional separate bridge plate and block that were then screwed together. Also in 93, PRS adopted a dual-action truss rod in all their guitars. In the mid-90s, PRS installed computer-assisted machinery and changed the way guitars would be made from that point forward. The new machines eventually took over the rough cutting and shaping of the necks and guitar bodies. This added even more to the custom shop level of finish and consistency and left other companies trying to catch up. 
All of these big changes were happening in 95 as PRS was getting ready to move to a new plant in Stevensville, Maryland. It was part of the phenomenal growth that PRS had had in its first 10 years. From their first year sales of a half million dollars, they had grown 20% each year to $10 million in 1995. It was also in 95 that PRS began its private stock program. Smith said it was like they had opened up the old workshop. Joe Nags was set to run the shop, and he said that these were customer design guitars. The orders were taken through the dealer network, with PRS then providing a quote. Nags estimated that the machine to handwork ratio on private stock guitars was about 50 50. Private stock guitars began to come out in April of 96, and by spring of 99, 85 private stock guitars had been built. The guitars each had a private stock number, along with a PRS serial number on the back of the headstock. Things that were learned in the private stock shop made their way into production guitars as well. 96 saw a move to a PC board five-way rotary switch, and in 97, new low-mass locking tuners with lightweight buttons were being used. Tim Mahoney with the band 311 burst on the scene playing Stoptail Custom 24s in the mid-90s, and he's continued to play them until this day. The next 10 years saw PRS bring out an array of models. The Bolt-on CE guitars, the Swamp Ash Special, a clear bid for more Fender customers, the short-lived EG guitars, the McCarty and the McCarty Archtop guitars, the overseas-produced SE guitars, the 513, the first production run of the single-cut guitars. All the while, the Custom 24 perked along as the best-selling guitar in the line. The core of the company. You might say that the Custom 24 is to PRS what the Telecaster has been for Fender, the root of all that is best about the company and the perfect platform for applying new knowledge gained along the way. By 2000, Linkin Park's hybrid theory was breaking sales records, and lead guitarist Brad Delson was rocking a custom 24 on stages worldwide. In a decidedly different style, David Knudsen of Minus the Bear was tapping and looping his way on his 24s as well. In 2002, they changed to the Phase two locking tuners, and in 2004, they switched to using lampshade-style knobs. By the 20th anniversary in 2005, PRS was taking a look back at its success. Still their best-selling guitar, Paul said at the time of the Custom 24, I'm always surprised when I plug in a Custom 24. It always sounds good. It's just a good guitar. PRS had set new standards for guitar production in its first two decades. Company president Jack Higginbotham said, Why is PRS PRS? There's always going to be debates about what makes a good guitar sound. But the goal of creating an instrument with great tone and great playability is just saturated inside of PRS. That's not to say we all agree on what that is, but we all have the same intention. That, I believe, is paramount. We couldn't be PRS unless that was the case. To celebrate the 20th anniversary, PRS released special 2005 versions of their three main guitars, the Custom 24, Custom 22, and Standard 24. The guitars featured special green abalone inlays designed by art director Mark Quigley and Joe Nags. The truss rod covers had an engraved 20th on them. And as an aside, interesting to any student of custom colors of Fender in the 50s and 60s, which were DuPont Duco based car color paints after all, Jack Higginbotham tied up with DuPont to use their hot hues, hot rod colors, on the new CE guitar models. Higginbotham was looking to broaden PRS's brand recognition and deciding that partnering with a car company would help do that. So he forged a deal with General Motors and two Corvette model Custom 22 guitars also came out that year. Also that year, the first Custom 24 signature artist came along, Dave Navarro of Jane's Addiction and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Navarro had been a PRS user for many years and it was only the third signature model after Santana and Mark Tremonti. The Jet White Custom 24 had a wide thin neck Mother of Pearl Bird inlays, and Dave Navarro on the truss rod cover. Around 2007, Michael Carter was playing with country star Luke Bryan, putting his custom 24s in front of a country audience. While back in heavier rock music, Peter Leffler was using customs with his band Chevelle. In 2006, PRS had begun building a new factory to expand U.S. manufacturing. Next to the current factory, the new building would be approximately five times larger than the original building, and it opened its doors in 2009. In the forward to the 2008 catalog, Smith said, One constant over the entire history of PRS is change. The desire to make our already fine guitars a bit more responsive, a bit more toneful. We strive to build the kind of guitar that speaks to you as soon as you pick it up. The kind of guitar that, even though it's brand new and full of possibilities, somehow feels as comfortable as an old friend. 2008 saw PRS continuing to make changes to their pickup designs. 
They acquired exclusive rights to the original pickup wire from the machines used to make the most revered 50s era pickups. Since 1957 was the first year of the humbucker pickup was available, PRS named the pickup the 1957-2008. These pickups were used in the Sumber series, McCarty II, and a limited run of 750 Custom 24s. At that year's PRS experience, Paul joked, Think of it this way. We're selling you access to these exclusive pickups and giving you a free guitar and a case to go with them. In the next year, PRS introduced the 5909 pickups into the Custom 24. PRS still sells 5909 pickups as an accessory, and they describe them as articulate while providing rich harmonic overtones with a powerful bridge pickup and a touch of brightness in the neck pickup. These pickups are the perfect two to achieve clarity and definition with a punch. By the early 2010s, hybrid guitars, electric guitars with piezo pickups, had become part of the modern electric guitar scene. In 2012, PRS added both a P22 and a P24 to their lineup. PRS had used the piezo system a decade earlier on their hollow body guitars, but this new system's smaller size allowed for it to be fit into solid body guitars, even those with a tremolo bridge. In 2011, they transitioned to the open back phase three tuners and the pickup selector on the Custom 24 was changed to a traditional five-way blade switch. In 2014, as a bit of a throwback to the 80s, the decade where it had all started, they offered a Custom 24 Floyd model. The guitars featured a figured maple top, mahogany back, but with a maple neck with an ebony fingerboard, volume, tone, and a five-way blade switch, a Floyd Rose tremolo with the corresponding locking nut and M metal pickups. The custom 24 Floyd being released was no doubt influenced by PRS working with Dusty Waring from the band Between the Buried and Me. In 2015, the pickups were changed again to the new 8515s. The 8515 is their take on the original 1985 pickup design, updated with all that they'd learned from the past 30 years of pickup development and research. Paul said, the standard treble and bass pickups from 1985 were more about the special wiring to get different sounds and the beginnings of getting single coil tones from a humbucker. We've learned a lot since then, and I believe we've done a very good job advancing the art into modern and vintage sounds, and greatly refining single coil sounds all out of hum canceling pickups. In 2017, they added a custom 2408, a custom 24 with the individual micro switches for each pickup from the 408 model guitar providing eight different pickup settings, including a double single coil option that's unique to that model. What Paul said about the pickups is a perfect summary of how they've approached every detail of the guitars over the years. I was talking to Bob Wilcutt of Wilcutt Guitars in Lexington, Kentucky, a PRS dealer since 1986. I said, I thought that from all my reading, Paul was perhaps more obsessed with wood than any other builder I could name. But Bob quickly corrected me saying, oh no. Paul is obsessed with every detail of the guitar, from the wood down to the metal that makes up the smallest screw. And I think we can all agree that we've all benefited from Paul's obsessions. If I miss something, or if you have your own PRS story to share, please put it in the comments for everyone to enjoy. I need to thank Bob Wilcutt at Wilcutt Guitars for sharing his insights on PRS history and some beautiful high-res picks of their current batch of drool-worthy Custom 24s. I also need to thank Gene Nooney, Sean Nuttall, and Mark Quigley at PRS for answering my questions and for sharing images of 24s across the decades. Finally, and most importantly, I need to thank Dave Burluck from Guitarist Magazine. This video would not have been possible without his excellent book, The PRS Electric Guitar. There's a link to the book in the description. I also need to send a general thank you to his colleagues at Guitarist for the use of the intro and outro music played by Mick Taylor from their 30th anniversary Custom 24 video. If you enjoyed this short history of the PRS Custom 24, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Remember to click the bell icon to be notified when we put out a new video. If you want to support the channel even more, stop by the store and grab a t-shirt or a mug. There's a link in the description. Thanks for watching. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt World.